everybody. This is Miss Rachel and this is Miss Heather from the Hagerstown Public Library and we are going to do our virtual mythological story time class whatever. Um, so first of all I just want to say that this is part of the 2020 summer reading summer reading program which is the theme is imagine your story. So feel free to come up and sign up for summer reading and if you do you'll get extra prizes for listening to this program and for reading and all that other stuff. So come and sign up anytime. You'll get a little packet with some information and you'll be good to go. Uh, we will share a code word at the end of this program so that you can get um, badges. Badges. That's the word. <laughs> I couldn't think of it. So you, you can get a badge for every program you do. You'll get a badge and each badge will be worth one ticket and you can like Put all your tickets into a prize. Um, we will have this program weekly. I think there are what, eight of them? Eight of them. Eight yeah. of them, yeah. So this is the first one, and we will have it weekly at on Thursday afternoons at 3 o'clock. There was a misprint that it will be at 4 o'clock on the brochures. It's at 3. And also we will be doing a craft of some sorts, but because this is virtual, we need to know how many craft sets to get together so we can set them out on the front porch and you guys can come pick them up. So if you think you're going to be here next week with us and want to do the craft, let us know so that we have an idea of how many to put together. All right, is that it? I think that's all the info. Okay, so we are going to start um, this week and next week. We're going to talk about the Greek mythology. Um, we're also going to get into Egyptian and Roman mythology, so this is going to be a lot of fun. This is exciting. Um, so were you, I didn't read this one. You can read that one. Okay. okay, so I'm just going to read a quick story on basically how the Greek gods came to be, so to speak. So, um, Zeus is the Olympian god of the sky. He is said to control the weather and also represent law and order. He was depicted most often with a dark beard, long cloak, and is never far from his lightning bolts. He fathered many children and also has a bit of a temper. However, he is most known for being the king of the Olympian gods. However, Zeus was always king. When he was born, he was son of the titan king Kronos. There was another king before he took over and another king before that. Where did Zeus come from exactly and how did he become king? Well, it all started with a prophecy. Gaia told Kronos that it was his fate to be overthrown by his sons, just as he had overthrown his own father. Eventually, it was the actions brought on by this that led Zeus to become king. Zeus was the son of the titans, Kronos and Rhea. Kronos, at the time, was king, a title he usurped from his own father, Uranus. Kronos was told that one of his children would overthrow him, and as a result, he swallowed each of his children whole to prove to prevent them from taking his throne. To prevent this from happening to Zeus, Rhea enlisted the help of Gaia. Rhea was tired of watching her own children be swallowed by her husband, so she tricked Cronus by giving him a rock wrapped in swaddling clothes, which he then swallowed. He was taken to the island of Crete and raised on Mount Dicte. In one version of the story, he was nursed by the nymph Almothea and raised by Gaia. In other versions, exclusively, Gaia raised him. When he was old enough, he left the island of Crete in order to rescue his siblings. Once he left Crete, Zeus knew that he had to confront Cronus and rescue his siblings. Zeus tricked Cronus by giving him an emetic, which causes vomiting. When Cronus vomited, he expelled all of his swallowed children. In some versions of the story, Gaia is the one who calls Cronus to regurgitate the children. After they were freed, Poseidon and Hades banded together with their brother Zeus to overthrow Cronus. Thus the prophecy was fulfilled because his own sons took down Cronus. After Cronus was defeated, Poseidon, Hades, and Zeus bickered over who would become the next king. Rather than fight violently, they decided to draw lots over who would have the honor. Because of the draw, Zeus became the king. Poseidon ruled over the seas and Hades ruled the underworld. Despite the fact that Zeus won the draw, many believe that he was destined to be, to be king anyway because he was considered to be the most powerful. Nevertheless, he went on to rule as king of the Olympian gods. It all began with a simple prophecy that stated that his sons would overthrow Cronus. So that's just the story of, um, that's the most basic story of how 
um, Zeus became king and the Greek gods overthrew the Titans. So we're going to go into some of the Titans' names and their descriptions, and then we'll go over some of the Greek gods. So Heather's going to start with the first one. Hey, I miss Heather. So um, some of the things you're going to hear are mentioned in the story that she just told. Um, one of the gods, or the Titans, was Gaia is the Earth Goddess. <clears throat> she made it with her son Uranus to produce the remaining Titans. Gaia seems to have started the Neolithic Earth Mother worship before the Indo-European invasion that eventually led to the Hellenistic civilization. Uranus is the sky god and the first ruler. He is the son of Gaia who created him without help. He then became the husband of Gaia and together they had many offspring including 12 of the Titans. His rule ended when Cronus, encouraged by Gaia, castrated him. He either died from the wound or withdrew from Earth. So Cronus was the ruling Titan who became, who came to power by castrating his father Uranus. His wife was Rhea. Their offspring were the first of the Olympians. To ensure his safety, Cronus ate each of his children as they were born. This worked until Rhea, unhappy at the loss of her children, tricked Cronus into swallowing a rock instead of Zeus. When he grew up, Zeus would revolt against Cronus and the other Titans defeat them, and banish them to Tartarus in the underworld. Cronus managed to escape to Italy, where he ruled as Saturn. The period of his rule was said to be the Golden Age on Earth, <clears throat> honored by Saturnalia Feast. Rhea was the wife of Cronus. Cronus made it a practice to swallow their children. To avoid this, Rhea tricked Cronus into swallowing a rock, saving her son Zeus. Next is Oceanus. Oceanus is an unending stream of water encircling the world. Together with his wife, Tethys, produced rivers and 3,000 ocean nymphs. Tethys is the wife of Oceanus. Together they produced the rivers and the 3,000 ocean nymphs. Next is Hyperion. Hyperion is a titan of light, the father of the sun, moon, and the dawn. Nimosine was the titan of memory and the mother of the muses. Next one is Themis. Themis was a titan of justice and order. She was the mother of fate, fates and the seasons. Iapetus was the father of Prometheus, Epimetheus, and Atlas. <laughs> Next is Coas, titan of intelligence, father of Leto. Cryus says there are no details available here, so who knows what Cryus was, the god of. <laughs> we don't know. We can only concur. Phoebe, Titan of the Moon, Mother of Leto. There's also Thea, who also there are no details of, so as with Cryus, who knows what went on there. I have no idea. Prometheus. Prometheus was the wisest Titan. His name means forethought, and was he was able to foretell the future. He was a son of Ipetus when... Zeus revolted against Cronus, Prometheus deserted the other titans, and fought on suicide. <clears throat> by some accounts, he and his brother, Epimetheus, were delegated by Zeus to create man. In all accounts, Prometheus is known as the protector and benefactor of man. He gave mankind a number of gifts, including fire. He also tricked Zeus into allowing the man to keep best part of the animal's sacrifice to the god and to give the god the worst parts. That's For for this, Zeus punished Prometheus by having him chained to a rock with an eagle tearing at his liver. He was left there for all eternity or until he agreed to disclose to Zeus which of Zeus's children would try to replace him. He was eventually rescued by Hercules without giving in to Zeus. Epimetheus was a stupid titan whose name means afterthought. He was the son of Iapetus. And in some accounts, he is delegated, along with his brother Prometheus, by Zeus to create mankind. He also accepted the gift of Pandora from Zeus, which led to the introduction of evil into the world. Atlas. Atlas was the son of Ipetus. Unlike his brothers Prometheus and Epithemus, Atlas fought with the other titans supporting Cronus against Zeus. So due to Cronus' advanced age, Atlas led the titans in battle. As a result, he was singled out by Zeus for a special punishment and made up the whole his, the world on his back. And the last one is Metis. Metis was the titaness of the fourth day and the planet Mer Mercury. She presided over all wisdom and knowledge. She was seduced by Zeus and became pregnant with Athena. Zeus became concerned over prophecies that her second child would replace Zeus. 
To avoid this, Zeus ate her. It is said that she is the source for Zeus's wisdom and that she still advises Zeus from his belly. It may seem odd for Metis to have been pregnant with Athena, but never mentioned as her mother. This is because the classic Greeks believed that children were generated solely from their father's sperm. The women were thought to be nothing more than a vessel for the fetus to grow in. Since Metis was killed well before Athena's birth, her role does not count. So those were the Titans, and as you can tell from the stories, they did some kind of crazy things. But, I don't know, it's what the Greeks believed in. So, <laughs> and now we're going to talk a little bit about the Greek gods who overthrew the Titans. So these were the Titans' children that overthrew them, took them out, said, hey, we're tired of it. We're coming and we're going to rule. So this is a, some interesting quote, facts about them. Mm -hmm. In Greek mythology, 12 gods and goddesses ruled the universe from atop Greece's Mount Olympus. These Olympians had come to power after their leader, Zeus, overthrew his father, Cronus, leader of the Titans. All the Olympians are related to one another. The, Roman, the Romans adopted most of these Greek gods and goddesses, but with new names. We'll talk more about the Roman side of it when we talk about the Roman mythology. But um, So the first one is Zeus, who we talked about. Zeus was the most powerful of all. He was the god of the sky and the king of Olympus. His temper affected the weather, and he threw thunderbolts when he was unhappy. He was married to Hera, but had many other lovers. His symbols included the oak and the thunderbolt. Next we have Hera. Hera was the goddess of marriage and the queen of Olympus. She was Zeus's wife and sister. Many myths tell of how she sought revenge when Zeus betrayed her with his lovers. Her symbol included a peacock and the cow. Poseidon was god of the sea. He was the most powerful god except for his brother Zeus. He lived in a beautiful palace under the sea and caused earthquakes when he was in a temper. His symbols include the horse and the trident, a three-pronged pitchfork. Next we have Hades. Um, Hades was the king of the dead. He lived in the underworld, <clears throat> the heavily guarded land, where he ruled over the dead. He was the brother of Zeus and the husband of Persephone, Demeter's daughter, whom he kidnapped. Aphrodite was the goddess of love and beauty and the protector of sailors. She may have been the daughter of Zeus and the titan Dione, but she, or she may have risen from the sea on a shell. Her symbols include the myrtle tree and the dove. Next we have Apollo. Apollo was the god of music and healing. He was also an archer and hunted with a silver bow. Apollo was the son of Zeus and the titan Leto. Or she may have been risen from, oop, my bad, and the twin of Artemis. His symbols include the laurel tree, the crown, the crow, and the dolphin. Next we have Ares. Ares was the god of war. He was both cruel and a coward. Ares was the son of Zeus and Hera, but neither of his parents liked him. His symbols were the vulture and the dog, although he often carried a bloody spear. Next we have Artemis. Artemis was the goddess of the hunt and the protector of women in childbirth. She hunted with silver arrows and loved all wild animals. Artemis was the daughter of Zeus and Leto and the twin of Apollo. Her symbols include cypress tree and the deer. Uh, next we have Athena. Athena was the goddess of wisdom. She was also skilled in the art of war and helped heroes such as Odysseus and Hercules. Athena sprang full-grown children from, er, excuse me, Athena sprang full-grown from the forehead of Zeus and became his favorite child. Her symbols included the owl and the olive tree. All right. The next one is a hard one. So, Hephaestus. Hephaestus was the god of fire and the forge, a furnace in which metal is heated. So it's like blacksmithing. Um, although he made armor and weapons for the gods, he loved peace. He was the son of Zeus and Hera and married Aphrodite. His symbols include the anvil and the forge. Next we have Hestia. Hestia was the goddess of the hearth, a fireplace at the center of the home. She was the gentlest of the gods and does not play a role in many myths. Hestia was the sister of Zeus and the oldest of the Olympians. Fire is among her symbols. The next one is Hermes. Hermes was the messenger god, a trickster and a friend of Thebes. He was said to have invented boxing and gymnastics. He was the son of Zeus and the constellation Maya. The speediest of all, he wore winged sandals and a winged hat and a carrier of a magic wand. Next we have Demeter. Demeter was the goddess of the harvest. The word cereal came from her Roman name. She was the sister of Zeus. Her daughter, Persephone, was forced to live with Hades each winter. 
At this time, Demeter let no crops grow. Her symbols include wheat. Okay. The next and last one is Dionysus. Dionysus was the god of wine, which he invented. In ancient Greek, Dionysus was honored with springtime festivals that centered on theater. Dionysus was the son of Zeus and Semele, a mortal. His symbols include ivy, the snake, and grapes. Okay, so those are the Greek gods, and we printed out some pictures, which we meant to show you as we read their names, but we'll show you them <laughs> now. So the first one, as we talked about, was Zeus. And I don't know how well you can see that, but... Um, Zeus, as you can see, has the thunderbolt, which is his main symbol. So the next one we have is his wife, Hera, and her symbol was the... Let me see. Bear with us. Hera's symbol were the peacock and the cow. So it doesn't look like she has either of them, but well, she's kind of got a bird on top of her staff. Sort of got a peacock. So then, next. And then we have... Poseidon, um, he's one of my favorites, but Poseidon, his uh, symbols were the horse and the trident, and you can see that staff he has in his hand is his trident. Okay, so next up we have Hades, and he was the ruler of the underworld and the dead. Um, his symbol was... Um, it doesn't specify what his symbols are on here, although that little U thing he has is one of his symbols, although I don't know what it means. <laughs> okay, next. And then we've got Aphrodite. So Aphrodite was the goddess of love and beauty, and her symbols were the myrtle tree and the dove. Okay, so next up we have Apollo. Apollo was the god of music and healing, so he's kind of like the precursor to doctors. Um, his symbols were the laurel tree, the crow, and the dolphin. Okay, now we have Ares. He was the god of war. Um, his symbols were the vulture and the dog, and he often carried a bloody spear. Which you can see the spear there, although it doesn't look very bloody. No, he cleaned it. <laughs> so the next one we have is Artemis, was the goddess of hunt and the protector of women in childbirth. Very important. Um, her symbols include the cypress tree and the deer. She's got her bow and arrow, and she shoots the silver arrows, and then she's also got her deer. Okay, next we have Athena. She was the goddess of wisdom. Her symbols included the owl and the olive tree. Okay, next we have Hephaestus was basically the god of blacksmithing, forge and fire. Um, his symbols include the anvil and the forge. So he's got the anvil right here, and he's making the weapons for the gods. I did that one. Is this one? Okay, now we have Hestia. She was the goddess of the hearth, uh, the fireplace in the home. And her symbol is fire, which it looks like she's got in her hand. Mm -hmm. So the next one we have is Hermes. He was the delivery guy, basically. Um, he was the messenger god and a trickster and a friend of thieves. Um, his symbols were, um, he basically did, he did, had a couple of symbols. He was famous for his winged shoes. I don't yeah. know how well you can see, but he's got wings on his shoes that made him fly so he, had, he could be the messenger. Yeah, and then he had wings on his hat as well, so that's yes. how he flew. Okay. Let's see, last one right here. Okay, and then we have Demeter, who was the goddess of the harvest. She was in charge of making everything grow the way it was supposed to. Her symbols included the wheat. Okay, next thing we have is Dionysus, and he was the god of wine, and he invented that. Um, his symbols include ivy, snake, and grapes. Mm -hmm. So those, um, those are just some basic info about the Greek gods. There's so many stories that you can look up about them. Um, it's really quite fascinating. But So that's just the basic info on the Greek gods and the Titans. And so we looked up some info on ancient Greece because we thought that that would be kind of interesting to see how, see I don't know, basically how things worked back then, so. Yeah, how, like, their lives were, how civilization was formed, and kind of, like, you know, the similarities between their civilization then as compared to now and what we have taken from them for government and everything like that. Yeah, we looked up some fun facts and some a little bit of info, so we will 
start with that now. Do you want to start or do you want me to? I'll start. Okay. This way. So here are the periods. I'll go through the three periods that were the big highlights. Um, historians often divide the history in ancient Greece into three periods. Okay. So the first one, archaic period. The period ran from the start of Greek civilization in 800 BC to the introduction of democracy in 508 BC. This period included the start of the Olympic Games and Homer's writing at the Odyssey and the Iliad. Um, period two was the classical period. This is a time most of us think when we think of ancient Greece. It, Athens was governed by democracy and great philosophers like Socrates and Plato arose. Um, also the wars between Sparta and Athens was during this time. Um, this period ended with the rise and then death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC. Um, your third period, the Hellenistic period. So the Hellenistic period lasted from the death of Alexander the Great until 31 BC when Rome defeated Egypt in the Battle of a Actium. The name Hellenistic comes from the Greek word Hellas, which is the original word for Greece. Okay, <clears throat> so um, now I'm going to give you a little bit info on Athens and Sparta. Um, Athens and Sparta were the two main city-states that ruled over much of ancient Greece. They were often rivals and fought each other in the Peloponnesian Wars. At other times, they united together in order to protect the Greek lands from invaders. The cultures of the two cities were very different. Sparta was almost entirely focused on war and how to fight, while Athens focused on the arts and learning. Ancient Greece was a civilization that dominated much of the Mediterranean thousands of years ago. At its peak, under Alexander the Great, ancient Greece ruled much of Europe and Western Asia. The Greeks became or came before the Romans and much of the Roman culture was influenced by the Greeks. Ancient Greece formed the foundation of, many, of much of the Western culture today. Everything from government, philosophy, science, mathematics, art, literature, and even sports were impacted by the ancient Greeks. You want to read those facts? Yeah. So we've got like some really interesting facts. Like she said, you know, the Olympics came from this. We have all kinds of different sports that happen, which is really interesting. Um, so here's some really cool facts. So the Greeks often ate dinner while lying on their sides, so that was okay to lay down and eat your food. Um, they invented the yo-yo, which is considered the world's second oldest toy after the doll. Uh, about a third of the population of some city state, sunny states were slaves. Um, there were more city states than just Sparta and Athens. Ancient Greece had around 100 city states. Um, the Romans copied much of the Greek culture, including their gods, architecture, language, and how they ate. Um, Phoebides was a Greek hero who ran 150 miles from Marathon to Sparta to get to get help against the Persians. After the Greeks won the war, he ran 25 miles from Marathon to Athens to announce the victory. This is where the marathon running gets its race name from. Um, when law when law trials were held in the city of Athens, they used large juries of 500 citizens. That's a lot more than the 12 we use today. Okay, so. Ancient Athenian boys went to school at the age of seven. At the same age, soldiers took Spartan boys from their mothers, housed them in a dormitory with other boys, and trained them as soldiers. Spartan men were not allowed to live with their families until they left their active military service at age 30. That just seems like a really long time to not be able to live with your family. <laughs> so ancient Greeks and Romans often bought slaves with salt. There is where the phrase not worth his salt comes from. Just like the Spaniards with their customary siesta, the ancient Greeks would insist on taking a quick midday nap through the summer. One 5th century medical text advised that a brief nap around noon kept the body from drying out. I agree to that. So, in ancient Greek mythology there was an unknown god, a placeholder for those gods not yet known to the ancient Greeks. In ancient Greece, the unibrow was a sign of intelligence and great beauty in women. Many women who didn't have epic eyebrows naturally used makeup to draw one on. <laughs> it's a difference in beauty standards today. Definitely. No wars were permitted in the month before the ancient Olympics. So that's, excuse me, spectators could travel to Olympia unharmed. During the Olympic truce, legal disputes and the carrying out of death penalties were also forbidden. The word music comes from the muses, goddesses of the art and Greek mythology. So 
Spike gold collars were invented in ancient Greece. So you got the collars and they got the spikes and the prongs on them. That's where they were invented. So, but they didn't serve the same training purposes that they serve today. She dogs on farms were wore spiked collars called melium to protect their necks from wolf bites as they defended the flocks of sheep. Some citizens of ancient Greece lived to over 100 years due to a healthy Mediterranean diet, the culture of physical activity, and a good sanitation system. In ancient Greece, men with pot bellies were thought to be exceptional leaders. Hey, without Big Macs and Twinkies, it probably took a lot of effort to get that desired look. <laughs> In Greek mythology, the gods punished Prometheus by having his liver eaten by the eagles. It was then regrown so that it could be eaten again every day. The reason for this was that in ancient Greece, the liver, rather than the heart, was thought to be the center of human emotions. So the phrase, let's spill the beans, comes from ancient Greece where they would vote using beans. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Birthday candles began in ancient Greece when people thought cakes adorned with candles, or excuse me, when people brought cakes adorned with lit candles to the temple of Artemis, goddess of the hunt. The candles were lit to make them glow like the moon, a symbol associated with Ar Artemis. That's pretty cool. One Greek statesman discovered a trick to help him defeat procrastination. Let's see. Do most the, do, excuse me. <laughs> Demosthenes shaved one side of his head. Seriously, shaved it off. Funny, but how does it help? Demosthenes reasoned, rightly, perhaps, that he would be less tempted to go outside if he knew people would make fun of his stupid haircut. Rather than miss the mockery and taunts of his fellow Athenians, he stayed home and studied. Something to remember next time you have a big exam coming up. Let's just shave the side of your head. It's fine. I don't actually recommend it, but I bet it worked. Um, yeah, so those are just some fun facts that we pulled up and looked at from ancient Greece. Um, it mentioned the Temple of Artemis, and I thought that I would um, just say that a lot of the Greek gods would build, like, temples. Or not the gods, the people would build temples for the gods. So, like, um, Zeus had his own temple where people went to worship Zeus. And, like, Hera and Athena, everybody had their own temple. And there were certain things that if you did them in the temple, like, um, like I don't know, if you disrespected the gods or, um, like, they had certain rules. And if you broke one of the rules, it was thought that the gods would, like, strike you dead from heaven. So, or Olympus, I guess. <laughs> Olympus, not heaven, sorry. But, um, yeah, so it was just one of those things that you went and you prayed and you, like, um, took food to feed the gods and that kind of stuff. So it's like everybody had their own temple and there were multiple temples, but it was kind of a cool thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So the next thing we're going to talk about is he's kind of like a demigod. Um, he was not a full fledged god. Um, we're going to talk about Hercules and the 12 things he had to do. So, Miss Rachel's going to leave us for a few minutes and I'm going to give you a little bit of story, okay? So, Hercules, known as in the Greek, or Heracles, or Hercules, is one of the best known heroes in Greek mythology and Roman mythology. His life was not easy. He endured many, many trials and completed many daunting tasks, but the reward for his suffering was a promise that he would live forever among the gods of Mount Olympus. It's kind of like the Disney Hercules, right? So early life. Hercules had a complicated family tree. According to legend, his father was Zeus, ruler of all the gods of Mount Olympus and all the mortals on earth. His mother, Alchemine, the granddaughter of hero Perseus, Perseus was also said to be one of Zeus's sons, um, famously beheaded the snake-haired Gorgon Medusa. So, do you want a random fact? So, did you know the constellation Hercules is the fifth largest in the sky? And then here's his story. So here is Vivrenge. Hercules had many enemies before he was born. When Zeus's wife Hera heard that her husband's mistress was pregnant, she flew into a jealous rage. First, she used her supernatural powers to prevent the baby Hercules from becoming the ruler of Miocene. Though, Zeus had declared that his son would inherit Miocene kingdom. Hera's meddling meant that, the, another, meant that another baby boy, the feeble Eurythenus, became its leader instead. 
Then, after Hercules was born, Hera sent two snakes to kill him in his crib. The infant Hercules was unusually strong, fearless. However, he, was stra he strangled the snakes before they could strangle him. But Hera kept up her duty tricks. When her stepson was a young adult, she cast a kind of spell on him that drove him temporarily insane and caused him to murder his beloved wife and their children. Guilty and heartbroken, Hercules tracked down Apollo, the god of truth and healing, and another of Zeus' sons, and begged to be punished for what he had done. So these are the heroic labors of Hercules to get to what he needed to do. So, Apollo understood that Hercules' crime had not been his fault. Hera's vengeful actions were no secret, but still he insisted that the young man make amends. He ordered Hercules to perform 12, 12 heroic labors for the Mycenaean king Eurystheus. Once Hercules completed every one of those labors, Apollo declared he would be absolved of his guilt and achieve immortality, so he could live forever. <clears throat> one, the Nemean lion. First, Apollo sent Hercules to the hills of Nemea to kill a lion that was terrorizing the people of the region. Some of the storytellers say that Zeus had fathered this magical beast as well. Hercules trapped the lion in its cave and strangled it. For the rest of his life, he wore the animal's pelt as a cloak. So basically, he wore it as a coat to show off, hey, I killed it, I did this. Um, the Lauranian Hydra. Second, Hercules traveled to the city of Lerna to slay the nine-headed Hydra a poisonous snake-like creature who lived underwater, guarding the entrance of the underworld. For this task, Hercules had the help of his nephew, Lalalus. He cut off each of the monster's head while Lalalus burned each wound with a torch. This way, the pair kept the heads from growing back. So with the Hydra, if you cut one off, then another head would grow back, and it was continuous until they figured out, hey, if we cut it and burn it, it's not going to grow back, if that makes sense. So, the next thing, he... This is the way he kept from growing back. The golden hind next, Hercules, set off to capture the sacred pet of the goddess Diana, a red deer, or hind, the golden antlers and bronze hooves. Eurystheus had chosen this task for his rival because he believed that Diana would kill anyone she caught trying to steal her pet. However, once Hercules explained his situation to the goddess, she allowed him to go on his way without punishment. The Eurymanthian boar. Fourth, so this is task four. Hercules used a giant net to snare the terrifying man-eating wild boar of Mount Eurantheus. The Aegean staples Hercules. Fifth task was supposed to be humiliating as well as impossible. Cleaning all the dung of the King Aegeus' enormous stables in a single day. However, Hercules completed the job easy. Flooding the barn by diverting two nearby rivers. So he just let the water in and did its thing. The this, the next one, the sixth task, so we got five, and what, the next one, sorry, there we go, <laughs> let's see, the Stomphlonian birds, Hercules' sixth task was straightforward, travel to the town of Stomiflos and drive away the huge flock of carnivorous birds that had taken up residence in the streets, this time with, with, it was the goddess Athena who came to the hero's aid, she gave him a pair of magical bronze quotala, or noisemakers, Forged by the god of Hypostius. Hercules used these tools to frighten the birds away. So he kind of used his aunt, or sister, excuse me, sister, and another fellow god to help him. Um, next, the Cretan bull. Hercules went to Crete to capture a rampaging bull that had impregnated the wife of the island's king. She later gave birth to a minotaur, a creature with a man's body and a bull's head. Hercules drove the bull back to Eurystheus, who released it into the streets of Marathon. The Horses of Diomedes. Hercules' eighth challenge, so we're on number eight, was to capture the four man-eating horses of Russian King Diomedes. He brought them to Eurystheus, who dedicated the horses to Hera and set them free. <laughs> I had to make Hera mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is totally counterproductive to what they wanted. So the ninth labor was complicated. Hippopolis belt. Stealing an armored belt that belonged to the Amazon queen, Hippopoli. So like the Amazons were big old girls that were very strong and very active and very furious warriors. Um, at first the queen welcomed Hercules and agreed to give him the belt without a fight. However, troublemaking Hera disguised herself as the Amazon warrior and spread a rumor that Hercules intended to kidnap the queen. 
To protect their leader, the women attack the hero's fleet. Then, fearing for his safety, Hercules killed Hippopolite and ripped the belt from her body. So this is labor number 10. Okay, we're almost there. The Cattle of Garum. For his 10th labor, Hercules was dispatched nearly to Africa to steal the cattle of three-headed, six-legged monster Garum. Once again, Hera did all she could to prevent the hero from succeeding, but he eventually returned to Mycena with the cows. Almost there. The apples of Hesperides. Herodes. Next, Rithius sent Hercules to steal Hera's wedding gift to Zeus, a set of golden apples guarded by a group of nymphs known as Hesperides. The task was difficult. Hercules needed help of the mortal Prometheus and the god Atlas to pull it off. But the hero eventually managed to run away with the apples after he showed them to the king. He, retur he then returned them to the gods' gardens where they belong. Cerebus, his twelfth final challenge, okay? Cerebus, for his final challenge, Hercules traveled to Hades to kidnap Cerebus, which is Hades is basically his uncle. Um, the vicious three-headed dog that guarded the ga his gates. Cerebus man Hercules managed to capture Cerebus by using his superhuman strength to wrestle the monster to the ground. Afterward, the dog returned on a harm to his post in the entrance of the underground. So, immortality. Later in his life, Hercules had a number of other adventures, rescuing the princes of Troy, battling control of Mount Olympus, but none were as taxing or as significant as the labors he had been. When he died, Athena carried him to Olympus on his chariot. According to legend, he spent the rest of his eternity with the gods. And that's the twelve labors of him. Of Hercules, and he beat Hera. He had cool. a very busy couple of years there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, that's one of my favorite Greek stories, is the story of Hercules. It's, I don't know, it was one of my favorites when I was a kid. Uh, we got a couple of other stories for you, and depending on how much time we have, depends on how many we read. <laughs> Uh, but the next one I thought I'd read is Pegasus. Um, Pegasus was the winged horse. I'm going to turn this a little bit so they can see the pictures a little bit better. Okay, so Pegasus was a winged horse. She was, um, or I think it was actually a he. It was one of a kind, very special horse. So I'm going to read the story here. Okay. So I'll read it and I'll show you the picture at the end to make it easier. There was once a long time ago when the winged horse, Pegasus, roamed the heavenly land of Halcyon as well as the earth below. No ordinary horse, Pegasus soared over mountains and galloped through clouds as effortlessly as he trotted across green meadows. Indeed, he was as free as the rushing wind that lifted his spreading wings. The ancient gods of Greece loved him, calling Pegasus the poet's winged steed, the steed of inspiration. His hoof once struck the sweet glass, uh, or grass excuse me, of Halcyon, and from that spot water flowed, bestowing the power of creativity upon all who drank its waters. From that hour, the three muses, the sisters of the arts, tended that sacred spring and the ancient forest surrounding it. A wild, solitary steed, Pegasus looked for no man's company until the young hero, Bellifron, went in search of him. This is their story. So if you can see, uh, I know there's a bit of a glare, but you can see Pegasus up here flying in the clouds. Okay, and this, um, you can see the three muses, uh, the golden dancing ladies. Those are the three muses who uh, watched over the spring and the forest where Bellifron's, or Pegasus's foot um, made the pool of water. Okay. So, once upon a time, there was a heroic youth named Bellifron, son of the king of Corinth, who had many enviable qualities. His bravery as a warrior was hailed throughout Greece. He was fair in his dealings and as handsome as any god. Such fame brought him enemies as well as friends. One foe plotted against the innocent youth, succeeding in turning Bellifron's good friend, King Protus, against him. Foolishly believing that the young hero had fallen in love with his wife, Protus planned revenge. He sent the unsuspecting Bellifron to the king of Lycia with a sealed letter. Now the king of Lycia followed an ancient custom of hospitality. He never asked the reason for a guest visit until ten days of feasting had passed. So when Bellifron arrived, he was welcomed by the king and his family without question. As the days went by, the youth and the king's youngest daughter 
Bellono were never apart. Love grew quickly, and Bellifron was at the point of asking for the princess's hand in marriage when, on the tenth day, the king at last requested the reason the young man had come to like you. Only then did Bellifron present his host with a letter. So here's a picture of Bellifron. Trying to get it lined up. There we go. Um, as you can see, he was considered very handsome in that day. The king took the letter and promptly broke the seal. Suddenly he read with horror these few simple words, Put to death the bearer of this message. Now the king had grown very fond of Bellifron, but he could not refuse King Protus. If he did, he risked making the powerful Protus his own enemy. Yet he was unwilling to bring about the youth's death with his own hand. Instead, he devised a dreadful task for the unsuspecting Bellifron, a task the king knew would send him to a certain death. The next day, the king summoned Bellifron and said, I believe the gods have sent you to me, for my kingdom is in need of a hero. Ask what you will, majesty, I am at your service, replied Bellifron. Well said, noble youth, your valor does you credit, answered the king. The monster known as the Chimera terrorizes the people of Lycia. Already it has ravaged great portions of our land. The creature breathes fire from a lion's mouth and tears its victims with dragon's claws. Every warrior who has gone to destroy it has perished. Will you be our champion and do battle with the monster? So as you can see in this picture here, um, Bellifron is talking to the king and the king is asking him to go get the chimera. These pictures are cool. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, this is kind of a dark picture, so I don't know how well you can see, but the chimera is up here in the clouds, like, breathing lightning or something, and he's terrorizing the people who are running from him. I think I'd be scared of that, too. Yeah, it's a little terrifying. Though Bellifron knew what he was being asked to do, um, knew that he was being asked to to go to his doom, he could hardly refuse the king without being considered a coward. But before setting out to challenge the monster, he asked the advice of a well-known soothsayer. You will fail like the others if you meet the beast upon the ground, declared the wise man. Your only chance will be to convince the winged horse Pegasus to fly you to the Chimera's lair and there do battle in the air. For upon the back of this winged horse you might use your weapon, weapon to pierce the monster's heart. The Chimera could be killed no other way. But be warned, Pegasus is wild and unlikely to follow anyone. I think I'd be rather, or rather be known as a coward. But um, here is Bellifron talking to the um, wise man who is telling him about Pegasus. I wish there wasn't a glare. Okay. Bellifron journeyed to a place where the wise, had met, wise man had suggested he might catch a glimpse of the winged steed. But expect no help from those who live nearby, the wise man had said. The villagers guard their privacy and do not like strangers. Many days and nights passed. As he wandered, Bellifron asked time after time for news of Pegasus. But the answers were always the same. The Pegasus? There is no such animal. The villagers laughed at him. Go back from where you came. You will find no flying horse here. Yet Bellifron lingered and finally he drifted off into the forest alone. There, as perhaps the gods had intended, he stumbled upon the legendary fountain of Pyrene. So here he is in the village asking the people about Pegasus. Upon a stone slab beside the fountain, Bellifron read, Come weary travelers, drink and be refreshed. For once a woman, Pyrene by name, wept here. For her only child, her son, who had been slain, long did Pyrene weep until she was transformed into an endless stream of flowing water. Pitying the poor mother, the gods have since blessed the spot and all those who drink from these crystal waters. So here it shows a picture of the crying woman who is um, crying tears into a river or a pond or whatever it was. Flowing water. Beneath a canopy of oak and hawthorn, animals of every kind came to drink without fear. Little wonder, then, that when Pegasus chose to walk upon common ground, he favored this enchanted place. As Bellifron approached, a, pe er, a pheasant flew.
flew from the marble rim of the fountain into a thicket. There was the sweet call of the goldfinch, and then silence. He leaned down, cupped his hand to catch the sweet water, and drank. That night, with little idea of how to catch the elusive Pegasus, he decided to sleep nearby, out among the stars, the moon, his only light. So this picture is really dark, but Pegasus is, um, or Bellifron is sleeping by the pool with the other animals drinking. As he slept, he dreamt that a luminous woman appeared, holding a bridle so fine and pale that it was barely visible. Noble youth, don't despair, said the woman. Present Pegasus with this gift, and you'll not fail to win his love. If you learn its name, it will bind you both forever. Blessed goddess, I can barely see what you hold and do not know its name, said the youth. Its name is Trust, replied the woman. I give it to you to share with your brother Pegasus. It will lie lightly between you and... None but the two of you will know it is there. Remember, you must be its as equals if you are to succeed. Now the bridle weighed, rested waylessly in Bellifron's hand. Then, as he gazed at it, the object melted into the air like a snowflake caught in his grasp. Looking up, Bellifron hoped to question his benefactor further, but she too had disappeared. The youth awoke to see that it was not yet dawn. The memory of his dream lingered while the distant village slept and a fog lay on the forest. He heard a sound. Bellifron turned. There was a horse walking, all alone, upon the fallen leaves by the fountain, like a ghost that walks in moonlight. The horse was watching him. Suddenly, he felt akin to his lone animal who waited now motionless for his approach. So here is the goddess who brought the harness to Bellifron. I think it's Athena. I always heard it was Hera. Hmm. I don't know. We're not exactly sure who it is. Um, I thought it was Hera. She thought it was Athena. So maybe it'll tell us later in the story. <clears throat> it's glare. It was crazy. Okay, so um, here, if you can see, you can see Pegasus in the forest and over... Over here on this side, Bellifron is sitting in the grass, but you probably can't see because of the glare. Bellifron drew near until they were a foot apart. Holding his breath, he tentatively reached out a hand. The horse raised his forefeet off the ground and hurled himself upward. Suddenly, a pair of magnificent wings spread from his broad shoulders. Now the steed was in the air, rising higher and higher until he was far above the thunderstruck youth. Pegasus circled the young man and then disappeared, obscured by a bank of clouds. But in a flash, he reappeared, landing, wings folded, hardly winded, in front of Bellifron. Pegasus pressed his velvet nose against the youth's shoulder, pushing him toward his flank, indicating that if the youth wished, he might ride. The young man obeyed, and all at once they were climbing through the clouds. Holding tight to the horse's flowing mane, Bellifron heard only the roar of the wind and the steady pounding of his own heart. They streaked across the sky, wildly dipping and weaving. Pegasus flew over jagged cliffs and followed a river that twisted and wound like a shimmering silver snake. The patient steed took time with the new rider. rider. Though they were both till now solitary, Pegasus mastered the clouds, the other hero of the earth. Together they learned the skill needed before challenging the chimera. So here they are flying in the clouds. I think it would be pretty cool to have a winged horse. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to do that. That would be awesome. At last, one evening, the youth gathered up his sword, spear, and shield and went to Pegasus. The stallion knew at once what was expected. He pounded the earth with his hooves. Snorting, he arched his neck and reared, eager for the young man to climb upon his back so that they might be off. Cloaked in darkness, the two flew up into the sky in search of the deadly monster. The chimera was the fiercest of beasts, with a goat's body joined to the head of a fire-breathing lion. Yet the monster had the iron tough scales, tail, and claws of a dragon. Its lair was in a black cave on the side of a sheer cliff that plunged down to the sea. Descending only when hungry, the monster devoured people and animals at random and burned the countryside with its fiery breath. It was nearly midnight when Pegasus br brought the youth alongside the mouth of the cave. Suspended in midair, at first they waited, only seeing the charred bones of cattle and defeated warriors scattered among, 
among the entrance. A whisper of smoke curled toward, or curled upward from the opening, and a choking stench filled the air, causing Pe Pegasus to snort. Suddenly, they heard a roar from inside the cave, and the Chimera sprang out. Fire burned from his mouth, and smoke engulfed both horse and rider. Turning, the Chimera whipped its dragon's tail at Pegasus. The winged stallion leapt nimbly to one side, allowing Bellifront to swing his store sword and a flashing arc severing the tip of the monster's tail. The monster's tail um, was like a snake on the end and it had like fangs so it was like venomous so if you got bit by it you were gonna die. So they took care of that one. The chimera gave a blood chilling roar never before had an opponent struck such a blow. Once more flames were flung at Bellifron and Pegasus. Raising his shield the hero deflected the flames and a cascade of sparks shot in all directions, singeing Pegasus' mane and his silver-tipped wings. In the air, horse and rider were one motion, now swiftly rising, now swooping downward to escape each attack, anticipating each other's moves. The youth's sword struck out at the monster time after time, but the Chimera's powerful claws were too quick and the thick dragon scales a supreme defense against its warrior's attacks. Bellifron's arm grew numb as his heavy weapon, weapon clanged and railed in combat with the monster. Not for a moment could the youth let down his guard. He had to hold his shield high and keep his sword nimble if he were to ward off the monster. And then the Chimera broke through his defense. Claws tore at the hero's arm. With lightning speed, Pegasus soared out of harm's way, saving Bellifron from certain death. So if you can see there, um, the lightning that's hitting the shield is, it's like uh, coming out of the snake's mouth, tail, this tail thing, I don't know. Bellifron cut it off. But you can see him on Pegasus fighting in the air. Here's a better picture, if you can see it, um, the Chimera and Pegasus and Bellifron are all fighting. It's pretty epic. Yes, <clears throat> these, I wish you guys could see these pictures more clearly. They're pretty cool. The battle raged on, and at daybreak, Bellifron had not found a way to drive his sword into the monster's chest. Now he saw that he must make use of his spear if he was ever to succeed. Yet, blinded by smoke and weakened from loss of blood, he continued to need both sword and shield to fend off the flames at deadly claws of the beast. Bellifron knew that his strength was waning and time was running out for him. He must risk giving up his sword before all his power was spent. Letting down his defense for but a moment, he flung his sword away and took hold of his spear. Skillfully, he aimed and thrust with all of his remaining strength. Streaking through the air, the spear cut through smoke, fire, and found its mark, piercing the monster to his very heart. The monster's horrible roaring ceased, and the flames subsided. Now there was only science, or silence as the lifeless body of the chimera dropped from the rocky pre precipice. Falling thousands of feet to the raging sea below, it was swallowed by the waves and disappeared forever. So you can see he um, threw the spear at the chimera, and... He hit his mark. Triumphant, horse and rider returned to the Fountain of Pyrene, and in the sacred spot where a woman had once shed tears of loss, the hero turned to leave his beloved Pegasus. He knew he could not hold the stallion against his will, but as the earthbound Bellifron watched Pegasus' alabaster wings catch the wind, lifting him toward the heavens, he hoped that his, this would not be the last time he would see his friend. At the news that the Chimera had been slain, there was great rejoicing. The king dared not attempt to harm the hero again, for, it, for he was now convinced that the gods favored Bellifron. Instead, he gladly gave his consent to the marriage of his daughter and Bellifron. The two were wed with much celebration and given a portion of the kingdom to rule together. And though Bellifron's duties were great and his marriage a source of happiness as the years passed, he found time enough to steal away from worldly things to seek his friend Pegasus whenever possible. So you can see here's Bellifron and his love in the, um, probably in the castle or wherever they were. 
As the goddess in his dream had foretold, the two had become brothers, bonded by a trust that neither could ever forget. So it doesn't specify which goddess it was. Who knows if it was Athena or Hera or somebody else. But I don't know if you can see, but there's a constellation of Pegasus there. So that's the end of that. And our time is about up. But before I forget, I want to give you guys the code word. So you'll go to the Read Squared website. Um, you probably need to sign up for summer reading first, so you can do that. Um, like you can either come in and do it or that's, yeah, that's probably just the best way to do it. So you just come into the library. We are open till five today. Um, we've got a paper you can fill out and you can write down this code word so you could put it in later. But then there's um, a place where you can click on that you did a program or something. And the code word for the mythology class today is Zeus. So it's Z-E-U-S, Zeus. So just use that and you'll get a badge and then for you'll be able to transfer them to tickets. I'm not exactly sure how all that's going to work, but we'll, we'll figure, figure it out. It out. <laughs> so um, I think that's all. That's it. We hope you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, you got a little bit of history, a little bit of fun, um, some story time, a little mixture of everything and just facts. Yeah. We hope that you join us next week and please sign up for summer reading. Tell your friends and family about it and we'll see you next week. We'll see you guys later.